California live oak. Magnificent tree, perhaps over 200 years old. I'm Dr. Tom Scott, natural resource specialist with the University of California. This species is iconic of the wildlands of California, and yet this tree and many others are now challenged and dying. One of the questions a person has to ask is, why are so many trees being killed? Why are these trees dying? What's killing our California oaks is a beetle no larger than a grain of rice. Timber! To save these oaks, we are in a battle against the gold-spotted oak borer, also known as GSOC. One of the things we look for in communities are the innovators and the people who basically are willing to adopt new ideas, people who are willing to take risks, people who do things that other people might not think that uh, fit into a normal pattern of what they've done in the past. And Brett Hutchinson falls into that category. I was struck that a person who is a professional arborist and oriented towards working with people in trees would know so much about the ecology of the insects and the environments in which he worked. But we went from knowing absolutely nothing about the way this beetle affects the woodlands to building a partnership where we now think we have ways to treat woodlands when they're attacked by GSOB. My name is Brett Hutchinson. I'm the owner of Green Tree Forest Service. I am an ISA certified arborist. I have a degree in environmental toxicology from UC Davis. I'm a state certified pesticide applicator with a restricted use permit specifically for the use of harbor oil. Dr. Tom Scott, through his expertise, has been our chief strategist in this whole battle of GSOB. He has helped guide the program that we have had going on as far as the directions of our studies, helping to quantitate all the data and of everything that we do out here. He's been actively involved in through the whole process. This is a beetle that's come out of Arizona, probably brought in firewood to Southern California. It comes into this new location and all of a sudden these beetles are emerging not at a time as in Arizona that's full of water and rain, but when we're at our driest time of the year. When you have a new pest coming into a tree that's never experienced it before, the trees don't have the defenses that the trees have that have naturally evolved with that pest. You can imagine that a cord of wood is 128 square feet. That may mean probably 400 pieces like this. If there are five beetles in every one of these pieces of wood, and there are 400 of them, then we're talking about 2,000 beetles that could be transported in a cord of wood. Or a half a cord is stuck in a pickup truck, so 500 beetles emerge in a new place, it could be 120 miles from where we are right now. And this piece of wood could basically transport that group of beetles to a new location. And so by the time the beetle was discovered, it had been dispersed through firewood through most of eastern San Diego County. Gold-spotted oak borers start their lives as an egg laid on the surface of the bark of an oak tree. Once they hatch, they burrow through the outside layer of the bark and down to the cambium where they begin to feed. Cambium is the growing part of the trunk. On one side it's producing wood, on the other side it's producing bark. They feed for most of the summer and in the late summer, sometimes as late as November, they move back out to the outer bark, burrowing along until they break the surface. In this case, this is a piece of wood where the bark is sloughed off 
and left the wood exposed. That is specifically the surface of the cambium. Now this is the growing layer of the tree. This produces the vessels. And actually in some cases in a really, in a really dry year, the vessels are extremely thin and close to the surface of this wood. And you can see the damage that the beetles have done. Basically there's no part of this tree where you have an unobstructed pathway from this part of the tree up to here. It's all been disrupted by the etchings of the beetle galleries. Then they retreat back and create a pupil chamber. Once in the pupil chamber they overwinter until it gets warm enough for them to pupate, that is turn into an adult. This process takes about three weeks and they emerge by chewing their way back out of the bark that they first came through and fly up into the canopy to feed on oak leaves and to mate. The females then return to the surface of the bark, lay eggs again, and the cycle is repeated. Now, one of the things that the trees do is they respond to this damage by creating what we call callus tissue. Callus tissue is running out here in the main part of the bark. It starts out undifferentiated, but by the time it gets to this outside edge, we can tell how many years the callus tissue has been in place and how many years the tree's been fighting GSOM. One of the things that's pretty obvious is that most trees suffering this kind of damage die within three years. We're trying to intercept this portion of the life cycle to protect the tree against the eggs that are laid later from any other beetles that may have come in from outside your sprayed area. And those eggs, when they hatch, you still have the barrier coat. When they go to try to bore in, then the larva die. So if you do it correctly, you can have complete protection through all the summer months when this different interaction goes on with the adults coming out and the larva going back in. When we're talking about uh, tree inspections and trying to figure out if trees within the forest have GSOB, there are basically four that stand out. Are crown thinning, lesions, woodpecker foraging, and D-shaped exit holes. Crown thinning is the loss of canopy in the upper crown, and usually that happens as a result of drought stress. While GSOB is active and feeding on the cambium and phloem layer, it is shutting off the sugar supply, which is supposed to be feeding the roots. And the roots then begin to suffer, and they don't absorb water, and that will lead to a crown thinning effect similar to drought stress. The next one you'd be looking for would be D-shaped exit holes. D-shaped exit holes, if they're found on the trunk, gives you an indication that that tree has already had an entire life cycle of goldspot oak borer that has gone through it. The other thing you'll find is the foraging from woodpeckers. That's evident in areas of the bark that have been excavated, if you will, by the woodpeckers where they are searching for the larva while they are in the hibernation chambers out near the outer bark. The last symptoms that you look for are lesions. And sometimes these lesions are very small looks like a very small wet spot or a spot where the tree has been oozing and leaking. Those lesions are usually associated with the initial entry of the larva after the egg hatches in the early spring and, and summer. Those are four main things that you're looking for when you're inspecting trees and you can evaluate trees based on the level of these symptoms and that can give you a pretty good prediction of the density of active GSOB in that specific tree and in the specific forest can give you a, a really good indication of where you need to spray and what areas you need to focus on. And then once you've identified these areas, then you got to put boots on the ground and go out there and inspect those and figure out what's going on. So when you go up to the tree, you're going to first start off um, with a, basically a chisel uh, and you skim off the very outer about eighth inch thick uh, edge of the bark and you search for the hibernating larvae that are in their pupation chambers during the winter. And so you chisel out a square that is 
approximately six inches by six inches where you uh, shave off that material on the outer cuticle of the bark and expose any pupation chambers that are there. If you find at least one larva, then it's also would still be considered low levels. But if you start getting to where in that six inch area you're finding two or three larva, that would be a moderately uh, infested tree. And if you find more than two or three, that would be a very highly infested tree, what I call smoking hot. And that's a tree that is going to release a significant number of insects that next spring. If you don't take care of it, one large, highly infested tree could release hundreds and hundreds of fully developed GSOB uh, beetles that next spring. And then those beetles will obviously fly up and, and feed and, and mate and start the whole cycle over again. Here's another one. This one is still basically in hibernation mode. It's still in the folded horseshoe shape. So it's, this one would probably still be at least at least four weeks. You know, it hasn't even really started shortening or changing or pupating in any way yet. But either way, we still like to do that to them. It's a very important under, thing to understand what your density is in these trees so you know where your hot spots are and how hot they are. Because uh, when you start uh, talking about spraying, you're going to initially try to focus on obviously your hot spots where uh, the trees that you've actually identified GSOB in would be your number one priority. And then as far as setting up a buffer zone around those trees, generally you would spray the hot area plus a kind of donut shaped uh, area around the hot area even if those trees aren't showing signs of GSOB because you're creating this encapsulation area. You're trying to keep those beetles from spreading out and, and also those trees on the outer peripheral may have low levels active right now. Just the signs may be so slight that you can't truly identify active larva, uh, but there could be some there. So the idea is to spray everything in that area so you just have complete knockout and the beetles don't have any place to go. So in the Oak Grove area, through the community involvement that we've had in about a six year period now, uh, every year we spray around 2,300 trees and through the inspections that we do as far as follow-up, we've documented that we've had zero uh, reinfestations of any of those trees that have been treated. So that gives us a really good indication that what we're doing works. Uh, the process uh, is well studied and documented and it's, it's, in my eyes, the best way to go. We worry about global change. Uh, I think everybody now is concerned about how much carbon we put into the atmosphere and uh, I do not know this to be true, but I have been told that many people are trying to find ways to create machines to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And the, the thing that we all know in our hearts is you take a look around you and here are the devices. Every one of these trees is sequestered carbon and they're holding that carbon and they'll hold it for another hundred years. And this is one of the few ways that we can actually store carbon in a manner that doesn't require a whole lot of our energy and time and activity. In fact, we get a reward that these places are actually pretty nice to be in. I'm not saying we're going to change the path of carbon sequestration, but it's certainly the case that every time you lose one of these trees, it's going to surrender all the carbon that it's captured over the last 150 years. Well, we're here in Oak Grove today. Uh, our spraying season has started and we're setting up this morning to do some carbaryl spraying on smoke trees. Uh, we're just getting mixed up today. Uh, this is our typical uh, spraying system. This vehicle is what we call the mothership because it has a 300 gallon freshwater tank in it as well, uh, which allows us to go out and spray and spray all morning and refill uh, out in the field so we can spray more trees faster. We have designed our spray systems to do what I call whole forest spraying, where we're, we're getting way out in the forest. We're not just doing the residential things. We're reaching out, getting to places that are much harder to reach in order to get the hot spots. But we have the ability to piggyback our hoses. We have these independent hose reels that we can link uh, end to end, which allows us to reach almost a thousand feet out from wherever our pump source is out in the forest in order to reach trees and places where there are no roads, uh, no trails, and plenty of rattlesnakes. The system we're running uh, uses a high pressure uh, spray pump that uh, averages 300 to 400 psi 
and we use a what they call a long range tree gun, uh, which allows us to shoot up to 30 to 40 feet up the tree. It has a variable spray, uh, which allows you to go from a fine pinpoint spray to a mist. So depending on how close you are to the tree, you can have different sizes of coverage. Also, the larger opening size creates larger droplets, so you have less drift and less contamination getting on other areas around where you're spraying. The box of Carborol, if you're reading the label, it says that for most bark beetles, you need to spray at a 2% concentration. Uh, we have found through our own research out here that we can go as low as a 1.1% concentration, which just means that you're applying that much less insecticide in the environment but you still have uh, effective control of the GSAW uh, the way you're, you're looking for. Uh, some other little details that are important is pH. The pH of your mixed water is extremely critical. Ideally, you want your mixed water down around 6.5, slightly on the acidic side. Uh, if you get it down on the acidic side, then you're going to be increasing the half-life on the tree immensely. I mean, you'll be reaching out to five or six months as far as the effective period that the product works on the tree. So obviously when you're spraying any kind of insecticide you want to wear the right protective gear and the label obviously will explain to you exactly what, what protective gear they require you to be using this product. Now I like to go overboard, I'm a toxicologist by education and I like to make sure that I don't take any chances so I plus all the people that work with me all go uh, the extra step to wear more gear than is actually necessary. Starting at the top we have a gardener's hat with a, a plastic shell that can be taken off and deconned. And then on the, your feet we have muck boots which are rubber on the outside so you can decon them as well. Plus these are also snake boots. Uh, they're thick enough that rattlesnakes won't bite through and get to We also use a full face respirator even though the label actually calls for just a, I believe a half face. Uh, I prefer to wear a full face just to make sure you get as little of any product on you as possible. And then we wear elbow length chemical gloves over our Tyvek, which is also covering your body. Carbol insecticide and in seven you know, in particular has been around for, for decades. It's a very uh, common uh, carbol based insecticide that is used for all different types of bark beetles. Uh, it's used both on pine trees and fir trees and basically any any tree that has insects chewing it their way in or out, this is the product to use to control that and it's been around for quite a while. It's been uh, used in other areas of the country very successfully against a whole variety of different insects. Carbol insecticide has been available even uh, for public use for quite a few years, but in California they've started to put restrictions on it, and that is mostly because a lot of times the public misuses things and, and uh, creates issues that then uh, causes it to be banned for public use. Um, 7SL is is still available obviously to commercial sprayers. It is a safe product if you use it properly. I mean, what we're doing with this specific application, we're spraying the, the trunks of the trees specifically. We're not spraying the upper leaves, we're not spraying the catkins, uh, we're not spraying other parts of the trees where other insects, birds, and other life forms would be exposed. 7SL is extremely toxic to bees. And if you were to spray the catkins or other areas where bees could be exposed, uh, bees will take this product right back to their hive, just like pollen, and it could kill the entire hive. So the method that we use for spraying avoids that because we're spraying only the outer bark of the lower trunk where bees are not actively harvesting any material. The right thickness to spray on the tree is what we call just to run off where the material just gets thick enough where it starts cascading down the tree, uh, but you don't want to overspray it where it's going to just run off the tree and soak in the soil and waste product. The idea is to coat the tree and the main trunk of the tree and nothing else. That uh, gives us the ability to have uh, effective treatment on the tree uh, without cross-contaminating other species. And the product itself, when you spray it on the tree, it is rain safe within a, a matter of hours after drying. Uh, so you have the ability to apply it and not worry about it washing off the tree uh, should a rainstorm come a few days later. My name is Wesley Ruiz, Jr. I'm the fire chief of the La Jolla Reservation. 
fire department and also a tribal member here. So, you know, once these trees are affected and they die, it could create extreme fire behavior. The remote areas where some of this is happening as well, we get lightning in those areas. We we'll get in there so we could have a, a bigger fire that starts a lot quicker. A lot of the areas off the reservation are that way where we have every other tree where the canopies are touching have died and are falling. For the wish that we create the meal, we use the black oak, so higher elevations. Of course, we use it for uh, heating, cooking purposes. The black oaks are being affected by the g -sob as well. It's not just a food source for the people here, but it's also the animals that live on the ground. The ones that pick up the acorns, you know, the woodpeckers especially. Just losing a tree, you lose a lot. So wildlife habitat for birds, uh, roosting areas. It also provides shade. So it does affect more than just the human population here. It affects all those animals that, that we live with. But when this beetle arrived from Arizona, it began to kill trees. Not just trees, whole woodlands. You know, you take one of these trees, a tree that's 100 years old, when it dies, it's not going to be replaced until you have another 100-year tree come up in its place. That's, that's looking at 40 or 50 years. We have like five years of data now um, for the use of carbaryl for protecting against gold-spotted oak borer infestation. So uh, I, I would recommend using carbaryl just because we have more data. Yearly application of these contact insecticides is what we've been doing for our high value oak trees. So we've picked campgrounds and recreation sites where we want to protect these trees for the foreseeable future. And we found really good results with using carbaryl and we have not seen evidence of further infestation. For the systemic insecticides, more costly, these trees are stressed by drought. If the trees are not healthy enough or if they have a certain level of infestation, then they're not going to respond well to either of these treatments, but especially to the systemic insecticide treatments. And every two years, those new injection sites would have to be chosen. If the wounds are not treated carefully, then you can potentially introduce new pathogens. We did a study to look at the soil invertebrate communities underneath oak trees before and after carbaryl spraying, we didn't find any significant differences in the diversity, abundance, or species richness. If you're a property owner and you have trees that are dying, you need them inspected to figure out if it's g -sob, is it just drought, there are differences between the two, and the trees can look the same, uh, based on both those conditions. So you gotta get out there, you gotta do inspections, you gotta figure out where your problems are, you need to treat uh, trees that are infested, and you also need to deal with trees that are dying as soon as possible. When an oak tree dies and it turns brown, especially a coast live oak, they're, they're evergreen, they should be green year round, when it turns brown, it's dead. When that happens, at the time the tree turns brown, that's usually when it has the highest level of active beetles and larvae in its system. So it's important that you take action on that fairly soon if possible. Cut the tree down. Cut it up for firewood. Pile the firewood in an organized pile and cover it with clear visqueen all the way down to the ground. That encapsulates it and if it's done in an area where there's good sunshine, it will actually heat up the environment inside the visqueen and cause the wood to dry out faster, which can halt and shorten the life cycles of things that are developing in that wood. Then also at the same time, if you're cutting this tree down and you have lots of, of brush, ideally that brush should be either burned, buried, or chipped, or hauled out to a landfill as soon as possible. g -sob can sputter along in a tree for three or four years, slowly working the tree system down and weakening the tree. When the tree gets to a weak enough state, then we have a, another beetle known as the western oak bark beetle that comes in, it generally attacks the top of the tree and the mid bowl, and that specific beetle brings along at least one species of fungus with it. Once the beetle activity starts, that fungus clogs the xylem, which is where the tree is trying to move water up. And when, once that beetle attacks, the tree dies within a matter of weeks. 
the western bark beetles populations are very high in the tree at that time and it's very important to process that material to reduce the number of both beetles, the gold spotted oak borer and western oak bark beetle. Uh, that's why control and, and treatment of trees that have just died is very important. You should do it as soon as possible. You know, a lot of people are always wondering, well, isn't there anything in Mother Nature that can uh, help control this beetle? And there actually are numerous different um, carnivorous insects of different types that do have a minor effect on GSOB and other beetles' activity. In this area, we have the green metallic beetle. The beetle and its larva are very active and hunts down other insects and eats them. Then we also have the red netwing beetle, which is also a carnivorous beetle whose larva is also carnivorous. We have a parasitic wasp. It's a very small little wasp and in the uh, winter and early spring when the larvae of the GSOB are out in their pupation chamber, this wasp actually has the ability to scour the outer bark and find a minute little air opening that the GSOB larva makes before it, it sets up to hibernate. That wasp will find that opening and stick in this ovo depositor and, and basically lay an egg in there and that egg hatches and the, the wasp's larva then feeds on the GSOB larva and you get a carnivorous wasp that comes out instead of a GSOB. These insects are always in our environment, they're just at lower levels. Their populations just aren't sustainable in a way that uh, would have a major impact on a major infestation of GSOB or any other beetle. Whether you have a hundred trees or just one tree in your backyard, if that one tree is infested, it's going to become an amplifying tree and those beetles will spread to your neighbor's trees. So in the Oak Grove area, we had had an excellent community response as far as getting uh, other people in the community to allow us on their property and do inspections and figure out where uh, the problems were. Since then, we've had continued involvement of the community and it has been very successful as far as controlling GSOB. We left Descanso about uh, nine years ago and it was sad because the years that we lived there were beautiful. The trees were healthy and it was one of the reasons we moved there. But over the last, oh, six or eight years that we were there, we noticed that the trees were beginning to die and no one seemed to know why until we lost almost half. And at that point, some proactive people were beginning to figure out that we had an infestation of a beetle. And when we saw the infestation moving in this direction, we knew by then that there were ways to treat the trees and we immediately got on the program and uh, we haven't lost a tree on these 10 acres since we moved here nine years ago. When we heard about the program and signed up, um, we realized that if our neighbors didn't sign up for spraying, that it, our trees could be threatened because of their inaction. And the way that we got people together is through Facebook mainly and telling our neighbors about a meeting. We had a neighborhood meeting here. There were probably 40 people or so there and Brett and Dr. Scott were there and they explained how it worked. Uh, they answered everybody's questions and so each person were, was able to make a decision and <clears throat> for the most part um, everyone was on board. There were a few people that weren't sure about the affordability but the affordability of it is shouldn't really be too much of an issue because it's actually the least expensive way to um, protect your trees. Here are the keys to fighting GSOB, early detection, and ongoing monitoring. Community-wide action with timely and consistent barrier spraying. If you're an applicator, use the correct techniques demonstrated in this video. If you're a landowner or manager, make sure your applicator is using the correct techniques. Otherwise, you're wasting time, money, and you'll be losing trees. Thousands of trees continue to die every year. So let's help each other save our native California oak trees.